I got asked, uh, was this 20 pounds well spent? So I'm gonna do that without laughing. <laughs> Prince Harry has given several very high-profile interviews to various journalists, but for the very first time he was going to talk to someone who was billed as a clinician. And maybe the choice of interviewer tells us something about the author's mental state. It certainly suggests that the book and the project places mental health, psychiatry, psychology, various mental health difficulties front and centre of someone's life. But it also raises the question for someone who appears to be a great enthusiast for therapy and appears to be promulgating the idea of therapy as a great thing to do. And throughout the interview, Prince Harry seemed remarkably enthusiastic about the whole project of therapy. It does raise a question about what recovery looks like. Because surely if you've recovered from something, you don't keep going on and on and on about the problems you had in the past. So it really raised a question about whether therapy has moved from a treatment to a kind of philosophy of life, something you never leave. And is that really the most helpful idea to give the public? The choice of setting was very interesting to someone like me. As a psychiatrist, I'm used to seeing patients in a clinic, so I know what a clinic looks like. In this interview, however, this was very much a kind of fireside chat. This was a quite upmarket living room in which the interview was conducted, and there was a crackling fireplace in action as well. The whole psychological communication sense that the audience was meant to get is of a very comfortable space, and Harry looked relaxed, and it looked like a very enjoyable space for him to be in. Now, as a psychiatrist working in private practice, I'm used to seeing sometimes the super wealthy or the famous. And one key thing about those people, I can tell you as a therapist in private practice, is you um, don't expect them to turn up at your clinic. They don't come to you. What happens instead is you go to them. Being a celebrity and a wealthy person, Harry doesn't realise that when he is encouraging people to seek therapy, they won't be getting that kind of fireside chat because they won't be getting the kind of celebrity therapist that Harry is able to get. What most people are going to get if they see this interview, then go to their general practitioner here in the UK at the very least or anywhere in the world, what they're most likely to get if they ask for therapy, they're going to get a waiting list first and foremost. And finally, if they do end up seeing a therapist, it won't be that kind of warm, cuddly environment that you saw portrayed in this interview. So does the interview backfire? Does it send the wrong message? Does it set up expectations for the public of what it's going to be like to seek help for mental health problems, which Harry doesn't understand because he's not part of that world? What he's advocating is something most ordinary people aren't going to get. What we should be expecting, me speaking as a psychiatrist now, seeing a clinician interview someone like Harry, is a different interview to the standard, very reverential interviews that Harry has experienced before from journalists. One of the things you're meant to do as a clinician is challenge the patient if they say things that don't quite make sense. The challenge isn't meant to be argumentative or meant to be antagonistic, it's meant to help to seek clarity. There were several moments where Harry quite clearly contradicted himself in the interview, and yet the supposed therapist didn't seem to take the opportunity to challenge Harry. Harry throughout the interview was a big fan of therapy and said he'd been helped enormously. And he was, you, you really got a strong sense he was well on the pathway to recovery. However, when the therapist asked him how did he feel having written the book, Harry said, and I'm going to paraphrase what he said, was it felt like a burden, a weight had been lifted from his shoulders. This was a slightly contradictory and puzzling answer because after all, if Harry had been helped so much by all this therapy he'd been having, why was there still a burden or a weight on his shoulders that could only be lifted by publishing a best-selling book 
and a multi-million dollar um, deal, literary deal. So there was something a bit odd about that, which is that that possibility of publishing a book is not available to the rest of us as a treatment for our mental health problems. So why did all this therapy that Harry had had not mean that he wasn't left with a burden? And the only way this burden could be lifted from his shoulders was publishing a book. There was a genuine, I think, implicit contradiction in what he was saying there. Throughout the interview, both people in the interview, Harry and the clinician interviewing him, made some extraordinary statements that me as a professional clinical psychiatrist was a bit worried about and I thought they should have been challenged a bit. At one point, Harry said that he believed at least 99% or something like 90% of the population, 99% of the population, um, had some kind of unresolved trauma or grief or loss. He said something like that. This was really quite an extraordinary statement. And the therapist, instead of challenging that, what's the evidence base for that idea, just sort of soundly agreed with it. So that kind of remark, which kind of suggests that everyone's unwell mentally in some way, everyone's got a mental health problem, is a problematic statement in my view. Now, the kind of California private practice therapy that Harry may be circulating in those kinds of worlds they're a big fan of the idea that everyone on the planet has some kind of unresolved trauma or loss because it's a great business proposition. It means everyone should be in therapy and therefore it's a great business model to promote the idea that everyone's unwell in some way. I'm not sure that's that helpful an idea. The kind of therapy and the kind of view of mental health that was um, displayed in this interview was one that would be regarded today by modern psychiatrists and psychologists as very old-fashioned. It's a kind of view that comes from the 60s and 70s. And for example, one of the ideas that is now unfashionable, but was fashionable 20 or 30 years ago, was the notion of catharsis. Catharsis is a Freudian term that refers to the idea that the way you cure yourself of mental health problems is to vent. Um, and Harry, in one part of the interview, talks about screaming into a pillow. And he thought that screaming into a pillow was a good idea, and he felt it would help him now, I'm paraphrasing what he said, if he could do a bit of that, or a bit more of that, now. Well, I'm afraid to say this idea that beating a pillow or screaming at a pillow and getting things out of your system while popular and intuitively seems like a good idea has been shown again and again to be a very problematic idea. After all, if it was true that getting things out of your system led you to be calmer, then boxers who thump each other up in a boxing match should be like Zen Buddhist monks when you meet them. That, generally speaking, is not the case. The timing of a consultation uh, requires a great deal of clinical skill and it takes a lot of experience over many years to make sure that everything's done correctly in the time allocated for it. There were several ways in which the interview was conducted that I found a little bit puzzling if this clinician was an experienced clinician. My understanding is that the interview was billed to last an hour, which is a classic therapeutic period of time. But it seemed to go on for an hour and a half. I don't know again whether that was planned or not, but it seemed very, very odd in terms of the way the length of time of the interview was handled. On several occasions during the interview, the therapist looked at, the, at their watch somewhat prominently. Now that's quite a sensitive thing to do when people are talking about sensitive emotional issues. If you to look at your watch, sort of kind of like is almost seen as rude in the world of therapy. So that's why in any experienced clinician you will see there's usually a big clock on, on display where everyone will get a sense in the room of just what the time is and how much time is left. So there were some aspects about the way the interview was conducted, the way the agenda was set up, which would lead an experienced psychiatrist to, to be slightly puzzled as to how much experience this therapist had in terms of conducting clinical interviews. Both 
people in the interview, Harry and the clinician, appear to be big fans of psychedelic drugs. This is a very controversial territory. It is true there's a recent resurgence of interest in the scientific community about the idea that psychedelic drugs, these are drugs that often make uh, people experience hallucinations, for example, very vivid hallucinations, that they could be therapeutically useful. But it's a theory, and it's still a very controversial theory. Yet I got the very strong impression from this interview that both people talking to each other were big fans of the idea that the treatment of mental illness might uh, be benefited hugely by attempting to try psychedelic drugs. I have to say that I would have been a bit more cautious I think maybe sometimes some people are helped, but I would also have issued a warning because certainly some of these drugs are actually associated with causing quite serious mental illness. Harry and the clinician kept referring to therapy in a very generic sense. They were both fans of therapy and were advocating therapy as the answer to life's difficulties. There is no one monolithic thing called therapy. There's at least, according to one survey, 450 different schools of psychotherapy, and they're often in opposition to each other. So I think that important message got a little bit left behind, which is that the person watching this interview who isn't an expert and hasn't done therapy should be made aware there's lots of different kinds of therapists. There's lots of different kinds of therapy, and you should be careful to ensure that the particular therapist and therapy you have is right for yourself.